How marvellous, how marvellous that we're here and can be together. For two years, the COVID restrictions stopped us meeting in person. And this year, I thought the weather event was going to do it today, but we've got here, all of us are here and, and dry and hopefully no parking tickets uh, yet. So welcome, it's terrific that we're here. Can I welcome the Deputy Chancellor, Professor Gabriel McMullen, the Vice-Chancellor, Professor Peter Sherlock of the University of Divinity, uh, CTC Senate members, Bishop Shane McKinlay, just off the plane, welcome Shane, Professor Anne Hunt, and Dr Francis Baker, uh, thanks for being here too after recent surgery, so we appreciate the efforts you've made. CTC Senior Fellows, Bishop Terry Curtin, one of our speakers, Monsignor Peter Kenny, who processed into the first, the opening CTC event uh, back in 1972. Peter, you're very welcome and thanks. Dr Michael McEntee uh, for joining us too among our senior fellows. Colleagues too from other colleges of the university, from other Catholic agencies, you're very welcome. And CTC, students, staff, alumni, it's great that we can gather and, and thank you for your presence tonight. I know it's the trying circumstances to get here in the weather. We have apologies too from the President and Chair of the CTC Senate, Archbishop Commonsoli, from Senate Member Audrey Brown and Emeritus Professor Jerry O'Collins. To all of you, a warm welcome. In recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's spiritual and cultural connection to country, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet and on which we work here, the, the Wurundjeri lands of the Kulin Nation. We honour elders past, present, who've laid down foundations and traditions and culture for emerging Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander peoples. And we commit to working together for a more just settlement between First Nations people and settler communities in this land. I, I mentioned too, I marked the 20th anniversary of the Bali, Bali bombings uh, today and to those Australians and people of more than 20 other nations who were affected by that event through the, through the deaths on that day, the 202 deaths, uh, the many injuries that people continue to live with and the ongoing memories and trauma of that event uh, here in this country and in other places too. And I recall among those my nephew, Sean, who was in the, uh, in the Sari club when the bombs went off. And he, together with other young mates, were able to lead a number of people to safety as so many people that night uh, could assist each other to a safe place. So we acknowledge those who've died and their families and those who continue to live with the grief and trauma of that event. By coincidence, really, this week, the 60th anniversary of the opening of the Second Vatican Council on the 11th of October 1990, 1962, beg your pardon, <laughs> reminds us of the close connection between the establishment of Catholic Theological College and the vision and implementation of the Council's teachings on the church, the church in its sacramental mystery, its sacramental nature, in its offices and charisms and ministries. The Council's teaching on ecumenism and the ecumenical future of the church. Teachings on the training of priests and by extension of all Christians, the theological education of the church. And teachings on the apostolate of the laity and the importance of the formation of the laity for the particular mission of the laity. So we're celebrating now the 50th anniversary of Catholic Theological College under the rubric of three words, remember, celebrate, and imagine. Or perhaps this, the current Pope might say, dream. That rich interplay of past, present, and future is a constitutive criterion of Catholic Christian theology due to drivers both external the continually changing cultural and social conditions in which Christians and Christian communities operate. This, as the Pope would say, more, not so much a, an era of change, but a change of era in which we live and which poses new questions to our faith, uh, to the gospel itself. But also drivers internal, that ever-living, 
ever self-donating word of God, creating an incarnate and dynamic tradition of faith, of life, and of intellectual inquiry. And so the topic of tonight's event, uh, as, as you see, 50 years of theological education in context, then, now, and what next? So we do remember, we do celebrate, and we do, with open hearts and minds, uh, take the risk to dream and imagine what next? What, what are the demands? What are the challenges? What are the opportunities for theological education and ministry formation in Australia in the years ahead? So I'm very pleased to hand over to the Deputy Master, Dr Catherine Players, who will facilitate tonight's panel. Thanks very much, Kevin. This evening we have five great panellists. Um, they'll be speaking to us for about 10 minutes each. Um, after that, I'll give them an opportunity to respond to one another if they so wish. Uh, after that point, um, we'll be happy to take questions from the floor. So our first speaker is Reverend Professor Austin Cooper, OMIAM. Uh, Austin has been at CTC for many years, teaching in church history and spirituality, and has spanned uh, about 30 year period as master over three occasions uh, for CTC. Uh, is much loved at CTC and has also um, served on many of our committees and boards uh, and is former president of the Melbourne College of Divinity, uh, now the University of Divinity. Austin. Thank you very much and welcome to this remembering. When we remember, we put Humpty Dumpty back together again, don't we? Uh, so we try to put together our own story. Yesterday I had a, a chat on the phone to um, Frank Maloney. We were talking about the, the Tridentine Seminary, which made a great contribution to the church over the many years in which it was the way of studying theology generally in the church. And I, I think that uh, over all those years, it didn't change a great deal, though it continued to make its contribution. But it was very t well organised, uh, a very full program. The effort was made, I think, to teach us everything that we could possibly know. I can remember sitting through a, a full lecture uh, in canon law on how one goes about blessing a church bell. Now, I've been a priest for 66 years and I still have not been invited to perform this very important pastoral function. Mind you, there's still time, but I mean, um, <laughs> So every effort was made to, to give us what we needed for the job. The old joke used to go around that uh, you could always tell the date of a priest's ordination by looking at his bookshelf. He didn't have to do any more reading after his days in the seminary. So there obviously was a need for some sort of change in the post-World War II period, and of course that was brought into focus more clearly by Vatican II in the 1960s. So I want to take up my story from that point. At the end of July in 1966, there was a very interesting meeting took place at Box Hill at the Franciscan Friary, St. Pascal's. Uh, everybody who was in, interested or involved in seminary formation was invited to, would you believe it, not a two-hour meeting, but a two-day meeting. And uh, I attended both, both of those days. I can't remember much of what was said, except there was a general view that now uh, we couldn't actually be tiny little isolated institutes alone. One of the things about the a Tridentine Seminary was that it was a very enclosed thing, um, very enclosed community, almost like an enclosed uh, uh, community of monks, really, uh, usually a long way from any settled area. Uh, and each of these little places was, a, a, you know, a, a tight-knit community unto itself. I think there was a general feeling at that meeting at Box Hill, no, we, we must belong to a bigger world. There was a feeling that somehow or other, with all the riches that were in the Melbourne church particularly, we could do a lot to serve the church if we acted more cooperatively together. 
I think one of the things uh, that came out of that, of course, was the formation sometimes of, of groups, uh, professional groups, say philosophers or whatever, meeting. But more importantly, I think, were the formation of friendships. Now, there's been nothing great done in the church without great friendships. Great friendships, well, you know, think of the history of the Jesuits um, and that wonderful book about the early Jesuits, you know. It really was a, a group of friends working together. And you have that so often in great movements. So the formation of, the, uh, formation of friendships, I think, uh, is something that needs to be highlighted in this whole exercise. The next point I think that I would like to just mention very briefly, and I don't just want to have a series of dates, but to try and give some understanding of what might have been going on, was of course the appointment of James Knox as Archbishop of Melbourne the, the year after that meeting at Box Hill. In 1967, early in the year, he was appointed, he was installed as Archbishop at the end of July of that year. Now within weeks, he had called a meeting at the Cathedral Presbytery to discuss seminaries. Uh, and I, I attended that, whether I attended it as rector of our newly established House of Formation at um, Mulgrave, which no longer exists, um, we've moved it, and uh, downsized it, you might as you might imagine. Um, but uh, I, I could have been representing the provincial, never mind, I was there. Uh, and my impression of that meeting was that the new Archbishop didn't come in with a great plan. What he came in with was a great idea and a great vision, that somehow or other all of these people who were able to serve the church so well could serve the church even better if they worked more closely together. I think that was the only thing that he had in mind. Now you might ask, well, how did I get into all of this? After all, I was comparatively young. I wasn't always an old man. And um, I, uh, I was invited to teach at uh, Corpus Christi College, Glen Waverley, in 1967. The pro uh, professor of uh, church history, John Prendival, was on sabbatical. So Father Charlie Main asked me to come up. I was already doing some teaching at Monash University at the time. So it was thought that I'd at least open the occasional uh, history book. So I duly uh, gave my lectures at um, Corpus Christi during 1967. And I can see at least one of my former students down there at, at present, there might be some more. Um, and they survived. And so did I. I actually enjoyed it immensely. Not only that, but Charlie Main apparently was also uh, quite pleased with what I did. Um, and I, I think that that, um, that probably is the point at which I enter the story. I'd often have a chat to Charlie. He was a great, great one to have a chat with. Um, somewhat shy man, but when you broke through that, you could have great, great um, uh, conversations with him. Uh, and I did. Well, the upshot of that was that one Saturday night, um, I was invited over to Raheen with Charlie Main to have an evening meal with Archbishop Knox. And I can remember this, and I think it's the most important thing that I can tell you about Knox, and it's this, that he sat me down on one end of a couch and hit the other, and he said, now you tell me what you think CTC should be. That's extraordinary. He was a man of many years standing, a diplomat who did extraordinary work in India and Sri Lanka as papal nuncio, asking me, a comparative newcomer, what I thought. Now that's, that's Knox. He was prepared to listen. He had a great idea, but he wasn't putting flesh on it. He was allowing it to develop. Just like Newman suggests in the development of doctrine, you have an idea and ideas just by nature develop. And so Knox let that happen. So after that, I was um, a member of the, um, the exploratory committee which formed the uh, first constitution of CTC. Um, and everybody who was involved in seminary formation in Melbourne was invited to that. And I think that most of them actually, I think virtually everybody came. It was clear to me that not everybody would actually be joining whatever it was that evolved out of this, but at least that was so. In the meantime, also, the Jesuits had told the Archbishop or the uh, uh, Episcopal trustees 
that sadly, the provincial was very clear about this, that sadly uh, the Jesuits can no longer uh, administer the two seminaries or be responsible for the, the uh, supplying of um, the professors at the seminary. Uh, he said that that was the darkest day of his time, but he did promise uh, that the Jesuits would uh, help wherever they could with lecturers for CTC and indeed also for formation staff at Corpus Christi College. And on both scores, the Jesuits have been wonderfully supportive and friendly um, and helpful. We, we just couldn't have got on without the, the, the Jesuit um, um, presence. So that brings us on then to eventually the formation of CTC. And I just want to highlight a few things that, that I would have said to Knox as I sat on the edge of that couch feeling somewhat embarrassed, but I, I, think, I, got, I think I got my second win pretty care quickly actually, and so I set sail rather confidently. I said, first of all, I think, Your Grace, that this must look like something that's in Australia. Now look, I, I, I know I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to. The Ratio Studiorum uh, are, are all very well. Quite frankly, if I, I tend to read them with a great deal of internal freedom of the spirit. Um, and I think that that's the best way. Because one of the things that I said to the Archbishop, I said, look, studies must look like something that you'd find in an Australian university. So, so we did just that. And I must say, I received a great deal of very warm support from, from my colleagues that we, we actually formed, we had three terms, 10 weeks each, and a unit of study in each, but three units formed, say, uh, philosophy one. You could have to do that before you went on to philosophy two. So there's a gradation and, and uh, you know, uh, an increase in demand and so on. This meant a reshaping of uh, the studies very, very, very profoundly, I think, and we managed it. And I have with me the, the first handbook of CTC, which is a Ronio document. Um, and somebody has copied it and has got the master working copy on it. So, um, and I've jotted down in it uh, the, the number who were attending each, uh, each unit. So that was very interesting. Something that looked Australian uh, and then something that would, would uh, really correspond to what was going on in an Australian university. So people for preparing for priesthood had to do a major sequence in systematic, moral and scripture, uh, less so in philosophy and church history. Um, but there were more units offered. If people wanted to do more, they could do more. Or if their particular diocese or order wanted them to do more, more were available. But I think the, the thing that I, that I achieved most of all was this, that about a third of a student's uh, workload would be of his own free choice. That is, there'd be a whole lot of electives offered. I was just flicking through the book, and for instance, Father Tom Daly, the, the Jesuit, offered a unit on Newman's uh, Essay and Development of Doctrine, uh, and another unit on Newman's Philosophy. Now, look, not a, you don't have to have everybody do that. Everybody should do my unit on Newman, but not everybody had to do Tom Doyle's. Um, and so, you know, I, th I think that's wonderful to, to offer that sort of uh, component to students. So I, I felt that that was one of my main achievements. Of course, it's all gone down the drain years ago. Why? For two reasons, because first of all, there were very important people, and I'm too diplomatic to mention names, who insisted on more units being given here and there and uh, insisting that they be done. And secondly, we, we moved from semester terms to semesters. Now, when you had a 10-week semester unit and you got 15 weeks of a, of a uh, when you had 10 weeks of a term unit and you, then you moved into a 15-week, it expanded out. Uh, and that, that, that was crippling. So, look, I, I think, and I want to say this, and I don't often get a chance to say it in public, the program is far too overloaded. It's not good education. 
It's not giving people the choice to develop their own interests and develop good study habits and wide reading interests so that a priest will be constantly reading. There are, of course, priests who are great readers, but, but everybody who is going to actually develop a love of learning at the service of the gospel needs to do just that. Now, from the beginning, of course, we always insisted on um, that this was all open to religious and to laity, and there were always some there. Well, next to the year after, we moved into the MCD, and that stood us in good stead, what we'd already put into place. Um, have I finished my 10 minutes? You, have I? <laughs> well, I better stop. Uh, and I'll stop with this. Look, um, was Knox right? Of course, Knox left a, a great legacy. He invited people, he listened, and when uh, J, uh, JTC and YTU went their own way, he didn't demur, didn't mind, that's the fact. Catholic unity is not about uniformity or regimentation. Catholic unity is about a wonderful blend of diversity in, and unity. And I think that we've achieved that by the wonderful cooperation we have bef between our, our three institutes. So long live the spirit of uh, James Knox. I'm so sorry going over time. <laughs> Thanks so much, Austin. I'm really struck by your, your comments on how institutions and structures can change our lives in somewhere like CTC, but also the impact of fresh ideas and friendships over those years. Uh, our next speaker is Reverend Professor Francis J. Maloney, SDB AM FAHA. Frank is a Salesian priest and an eminent scholar of the New Testament. Um, he has a long-standing connection with CTC, um, a patch of time as um, lecturer and head of department earlier in his career at CTC, uh, and then uh, substantial contributions at ACU and Catholic University of America. Uh, more recently, he's back at CTC, and he's a senior professorial fellow of the university. Thanks very much, Frank. Thank you. Well, I better pour some cold water on the radical speaker who's preceded me. In 1968, I was in my second year of theological studies in Rome when I received a brief but life-determining letter from the Australian Provincial of the Salesians at that time, Father Terry Jennings. He informed me that the Salesians wished to be part of the process of establishing a post-conciliar unified seminary initiated by the then Archbishop Knox. All participants in the planned institution were asked to contribute a qualified person to the academic faculty. Our late lamented Norman Ford was already active on the scene, but Father Jennings asked if I would be prepared to continue my studies after ordination, specialising in any area that interested me, except for philosophy that Norm had well covered. At that time, I was following a course on the letter to the Romans taught by the inspiring Jules Combier, a gifted Belgian Salesian who was making a major contribution at the Leopoldville campus of the University of Louvain in the Belgian Congo. There was to be no more back to Rupertswood, where I had laboured prior to going to Rome. It's funny how you finish up where you began. There was to be no... I was destined for biblical studies. I eventually started teaching at CTC in the second semester of 1976, having defended my dissertation in the previous July and immediately dispatched by my superiors to the Salesian University in Rome for a year. In 1976, the students were predominantly young men from Corpus Christi Seminary, housed in the same location at Clayton, and various religious preparing to be ordained for the Catholic priesthood. But from the start, there were always religious men and women and interested lay people, especially teachers from the Catholic schools. And introduced to my first class by Father Chris Hope, who was teaching New Testament at that time, I delivered what I regarded a first-rate introductory reflection on the Gospel of John. Early in the term, in those days, as Austin has just hinted, students shopped around 
for the first week or two, settling on the courses they thought would be the most useful. At the end of my first two hours, one of the students asked me, what is the pastoral usefulness of this course? <laughs> Hopefully, that question has shaped all that I have taught and written since then. For many years, I was a part of the then of CTC. Each year, we taught the gospel of that lectionary year and a general introduction to the Pauline literature. On alternate years, we taught the Gospel of John and the Letter to the Romans, major theological building blocks of the Christian tradition. We taught each course twice, during the day and during in an evening session. We had two sessions for each course in one session and then a one-hour session. We ran a three-term year, as Austin just mentioned, and each course was squashed into a term of 10 weeks. With three terms, we were able to teach electives, as Austin just mentioned. For example, I researched and taught courses on Johannine Christology, the infancy narratives of Matthew and Luke, the passion narratives, the resurrection narratives, the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith. Despite their elective nature, they were well attended. I recall that as I closed the, the course on the infancy narratives, I had promised I would look at the historical issues underlining these differing accounts and the theological importance of that difference. The major lecture hall was packed for the last lecture, including the rectors and formation staff of our many associated institutes. Just what was this man teaching these boys? The scene changed as we adopted a two semester year and the Roman authorities restructured the Ratio Studiorum required for ordination to the priesthood. On the one hand, we had to cover all the material required by Roman authorities, and on the other, we had to do it in two semesters. This was the situation that led to the current curriculum. But the early years have left their mark. One of the synoptics each year, a general course on Paul, and the yearly alternation of the letter to the Romans and the Gospel of John. The loss of electives was necessary but a shame. Those courses were exciting for all. Every one of those courses that I've just mentioned have eventually become a major element in my own personal research and publication. Looking back across that earliest period that has led to the current curriculum, there can be no denying the fact that CTC has had an abundance of post-Vatican II trained specialists who made a massive contribution to the theological education of several generations. I'm amazed as I chat with people from those days, both lay and clerical, how well they recall what we shared and how much it has impacted on their lives and ministry. One of the unplanned benefits of those years together has been the development of an unprecedented awareness of the mutuality, richness and friendship that is shared across the diversity of diocesan clergy, religious women and men, Catholic and non-Catholic people. One of the many high points in my memories of those early years was teaching Paul's letter to the Romans to an enthusiastic and intelligent Lutheran pastor. I suspect that I learnt more than he did that semester. I think it can be justifiably claimed that those years founded a teaching and research tradition at CTC that is contemporary, critical and loyal to the Catholic Church's magisterium. I have been unquestioningly supported by CTC and a queue of masters from Austin Cooper to Kevin Lenehan across a lifetime of research and publication. We must also salute the skillful leadership of the library managers and their staff. Estelle Robinson, Kay Cole, Tony McCumsty, and Kerry Burns, who we have with us this evening. Four library managers in 50 years says something about their quality, as does the quality of the research produced by the students and staff of CTC whom the library served. Some students and alumni would have liked us to be more radical. We can't all be like Austin. More politically oriented. More a part of a challenged Australian society and culture. 
Maybe we had too many answers and not enough questions. On the other hand, some had problems with any critical innovation. I recall across a period of several years when I was regularly questioned by students who cited Dave Erbum 19 at me as I insisted that the four evangelists be allowed their own voice in the way they shaped the same traditions. They would solemnly cite Dave Erbum 19, these four gospels whose historicity Holy Mother Church unhesitatingly affirms faithfully hand on what Jesus, the Son of God, while he lived among men and women, really did and taught for their salvation until the day he was taken up. Therefore, Father, you are wrong. <laughs> to this I could only answer, please continue to read Dave Verbum 19. <laughs> After the ascension of the Lord, the apostles handed on to their hearers what he had said and done. But with that fuller understanding, which they, instructed by the glorious events of Christ and enlightened by the spirit of truth, now enjoyed, they selected certain of the many elements that had been handed on. They synthesized or explained them with an eye to the situation of the churches. They retained the preaching style, but always in such a fashion as they have told us the authority the authentic truth about Jesus, unquote. Vatican II, they had to learn, insisted that gospels were narratives, inspired literary creations that communicated authentic and salvific truths about Jesus. They were theology, not history books. I look back upon the serious, creative, and critically loyal Catholic contribution of CTC to theological education with pride. Those years we can now call the then, have been maintained and substantially improved in the now of CTC, as its leadership, staff and students have responded to both internal and external challenges. I have been fortunate to belong to both eras. The communication of the Catholic faith tradition has never been easy. Paul articulated the challenge as early as 52 CE, for Jews demand signs, and Greeks to desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. Or as Luke has Paul proclaim in his trial before the governor Felix at Caesarea, it is about the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you today. Christian theological education will always bring its challenges. What next? Allow me to close with the experience of several CTC so-called experts at the Plenary Council of the Catholic Church in Australia. Never called upon, all of us were in an underground classroom where we followed the proceedings via video. A ray of hope emerged as the council drew to closure. We were asked to write a summary statement that might serve as a word from the Pliny to Australian society at large. A small subcommittee was formed to write this document and the whole team of experts discussed it and edited it further. Strangely, or maybe not so strangely, it was never used. It is much better than the final statement that was used. The future of CTC is ours to shape. We might listen to the non-published summary of the outstanding initiative of the Plenary Council of the Australian Catholic Church and take it on as an agenda for what lies ahead. Quote, we believe that the Catholic community at its best has enhanced life in Australia through its witness to gospel values, which inspire its care for the sick and the marginalised, its commitment to education and its advocacy for social justice, especially in the context of the current needs of refugees and asylum seekers. We commit ourselves to seek and serve the human flourishing of all Australians. And we closed with this final hope, surely essential to the future agenda of CTC. This council, as followers of Jesus Christ, recognises the generational, cultural, ethnic and religious diversity of contemporary Australia and the desires that the Catholic community participate constructively with all traditions of faith and all worldviews that open our minds to spiritual and religious values, and with all people of goodwill who contribute to the common good of all Australians. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Frank. Uh, you've, your speech has demonstrated to us your care for those adjectives that you held up for us, contemporary, critical, loyal, and pastoral. Thank you. Our next speaker is Most Reverend Dr. Terence Curtin, DD. Bishop Terry was ordained as a priest in 1971 for the Archdiocese of Melbourne and as an auxiliary bishop for Melbourne in 2014. Uh, after an earlier career involving pastoral ministry and work at ACU, uh, he came to CTC where he has been master early in the 21st century, uh, head of the Department of Systematics and also vice president of the Melbourne College of Divinity. Thanks very much. I must admit, never being sure of these events, I went to Google and it told me that uh, 12, 1,200 words is eight minutes, so we'll see if they're right. I came to Catholic Theological College at the start of 2003 as the new master. My previous academic experience had been at Australian Catholic University and its predecessor colleges beginning in 1975. It was a new experience for me, one that I really had not sought, but Archbishop Hart asked that I allow my name to go forward for consideration. I remember Father Austin Cooper's words when my appointment was announced to the CTC community. What did he say? I've been on the ramparts looking for reinforcements for some time, and now they're coming. I think he'd been recycled four times by then as master if that's the right word. What then followed was eight years as master, including two as the last president of the Melbourne College of Divinity, which set me on a task of finding the vice chancellor, who is right here now, with Graham Blackman as my deputy at the time, and we were so grateful when he said yes. And then after that, there were another four years as head of the systematic theology department, which took me up to the end of 2014, when I was then appointed as Auxiliary Bishop in Melbourne. The plus in coming to CTC was that I entered into an academic community whose mission was to exist for the academic formation of priestly candidates, religious and lay people, for the pastoral service of the church, particularly in Victoria and Tasmania. Its vision, according to the college constitution, was to cultivate and promote through academic research the theological sciences and to deepen knowledge of Christian revelation and matters connected with it. The student body comprised seminarians from affiliated seminaries and a significant proportion of private students so-called because they were not looking towards ordination. The Missionaries of God's Love in 2007 and the Dominican Friars in 2009 affiliated with CTC and have since provided academic staff for the college. In 2004, 9% of the student body came from other Christian traditions. This surely reflected the college's membership of the MCD as an associated teaching institution. The Australian University's Quality Agency's audit of MCD in 2005 commends, and I quote, a culture of mutual respect and tolerance, almost perfectly matched by a cohesive philosophy of ecumenism, which binds the ATIs together as mutually supportive parts of the whole. In the period, 2005 to 2009, student enrolment grew from 228 to 308, roughly an increase of one third in four years. At CTC, I found an academic community aware of the contribution it had to make to the education of future priests, teachers, and lay faithful, and bringing into that commitment their own pastoral experience as well. The focus was on the theological education and intellectual formation of students studying for the Catholic priesthood, but the performance portfolio of 2004 recognises the need to develop the college's work in the academic formation of religious and lay people, 
for the church's pastoral ministry. In 2004, the college had two full-time academic staff, the master and the academic dean, and some 35 part-time or sessional staff. The addition of new staff in 2005 enabled creation of the position of research and postgraduate coordinator. Having gone through the establishment of Australian Catholic University out of its foundations in Catholic teachers' colleges, I was aware of the need for strategic intent that the college might build on its strengths, its new location in East Melbourne, and engage with developments in tertiary education. Part of this came with the co-option of experienced academics from ACU to the Senate and the College Academic Board. CTC also needed a more explicit, self-aware system of quality management, rather than the unexamined continuation of assumed quality practices from the past. For example, at the end of each semester, the practice had been that the lecturer in charge of a unit had to submit a separate result, signed result sheet for every piece of assessment. So if there were three assessment tasks and 20 students, this meant 60 forms to sign at the end of the term. It took a while to convince the academic dean to discontinue the practice and only require a single result sheet for the whole unit. Unit evaluation was another area for reconsideration. Evaluations depended very much on the particular lecturer. Some asked for the names, others did not. It was fairly open, so then we had to try and come to something that was more standard across them would give us some feedback as to what we need to be thinking about. The college also had 13 teaching weeks for each semester where other MCD, ATIs and tertiary institutions had 12. To change to 12 meant greater possibilities for student cross-enrolment between CTC, other MCD, ATIs and other universities, as well as more time to offer intensive units during the mid-year semester break. There was some staff resistance and it took time to achieve this change. Debate at Academic Board raised a number of issues. The purpose of tertiary teaching, the required knowledge of a particular discipline and its methodology, and how to enable student mastery in a discipline. One particular person who is now a bishop, you may work it out, and not the man who's here, um, gave me such an argument, I said at the end of it, Mark, um, you've really given me an argument for 30 weeks and not 13. And so, you know, this, this was part of it. When the vote finally went through, I remember the exchange between Father Austin Cooper and another lecturer who was opposed to the change. On seeing Father Austin make the sign of the cross at the end of the meeting, the remark was, well, Austin, I hope you're praying for forgiveness. <laughs> to which came the wonderful reply, no, I'm praying for your salvation. <laughs> In 2005, CTC moved to 12-week to 12 semesters. A recognised need of these years was to develop the college's research profile and culture. The lack of full-time staff meant a lesser research culture due to the other duties and responsibilities of part-time and sessional lecturers. The 2009 CTC audit portfolio reports an increased number of full-time and part-time academic staff, enabling provision of courses and supervision of students in higher degrees by research, with less reliance on sessional academic staff to teach course units. 2005 saw the reintroduction of lunchtime research seminars, where staff members presented on a topic related to their current research to interested staff and postgraduate students. Funding for research purposes increased by almost a third from 2005 to 2008. In the same period, enrolments increased by a third with a marked swing to postgraduate coursework units exceeding the enrolment goals set for this period. Restitution of the Thomas Carr Centre in 2008 
to the academic purposes for which it was designed assisted CTC in its educational activities, where earlier the college had to compete with use of the building as a conference centre and a regular meeting place for diocesan agencies. The woman running the, that centre at the time would come in to me complain that students were picking up slices of cake and sandwiches as they walked through to their lectures. <laughs> no surprise there. The performance portfolio of 2004 remarks, CTC must think creatively about its service to a changing church and society. It has a fine resource in its current staff and students but a larger student body will be attracted to CTC by its scholarship and the application of that scholarship to the mission of the church and the life of faith in the contemporary world. The need for good theological edu education remains, not just for the ordained, but also for the baptised, for we are embarking on a new era with the Synod on Synodality next year. This is not just a single event, but a process that will continue for the whole church in the years that lie ahead. We're already seeing parts of the fruits of that in the various writings of Pope Francis as we are brought to look again and to start to come to what the realities are that we're dealing with. Theological literacy is crucial if the church, the pilgrim people of God in the teaching of the Second Vatican Council, is to give true witness on his journey of faith. It requires us to listen and dialogue with the world as it really is and not as we would like it to be. Not trapped by the spirit of the times, which is the language of this world, we look for the signs of the times where God speaks to us through the events of this world. It means we must reread the gospel message in the light of the historical and current experience of the church and engage in contemplative reflection on that experience. This rereading requires a new and deeper reading and understanding of scripture and tradition, the two sources of that faith and of the signs of the times. The college motto is take and read. Seems to me, stay true to this and we are on the right path. Thank you, Bishop Terry. I'm uh, thinking about how you were talking about the signs of the times toward the end, and, and part of the signs of the times may not um, strike us immediately, but I think that is also that when we have new people who come to our college, uh, like yourself, um, they're able to bring uh, different perspectives, uh, different experiences from our working lives uh, prior to that point and so forth. Uh, Dr. Rosemary Canavan has also had a complicated and interesting career. Uh, she's senior lecturer in um, biblical studies at uh, Catholic Theological College and a Catholic laywoman. Uh, Rosemary uh, was previously uh, associate dean and then academic dean at the college uh, for uh, two terms, uh, but um, came to her biblical studies after a career in administration as well. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Sorry for the delay. So in light of the marvelous span of 50 years, and my perspective this evening is of the most recent decade and one that verges on the opening of the next 50. Not that I'm likely to see that in its entirety. So, so first then, 
As I peer back with you into the recent past, it coincides, as uh, Catherine mentioned, with my own arrival at CTC, an arrival that brought me from South Australia with only a brief sketch of the history of this institution that I joined. It was 2011. The ver new master, the very reverent doctor, soon to be associate professor, uh, Shane McKinley, had just been appointed and I was employed uh, with the view to fill the position he had vacated, uh, the uh, Associate Dean Postgrad and Research. I joined the executive, which also include, included Francis Baker and uh, Brian Boyle. CTC was then a teaching institute of the MCD. There was a sense that this was a new time, as there were some other new faces among the faculty and one returning, namely Kevin Lenahan. Yet that sense of newness was about to take a major shift as within one year, MCD began the transition to the University of Divinity. The unfurling of the experience of becoming a university and indeed the first university of specialization in Australia was exciting with all the potential of bringing all our wisdom and knowledge into a new way of flourishing. It was indeed this, but so much more. I, as many of you, have understood in our lifetime that change is the only constant, but change is also the breath of the spirit. It has been a good life lesson as we set sail on the sea where our faith would be tested, as we grappled with our ongoing transformation, as we embarked on that new adventure, little did we know that by 2021, our status as university would be brought into that of Australian university. At the beginning of this period, CTC taught face-to-face -face only, day and evening, and occasionally off campus, usually for teacher accreditation. In these years, we sealed up the submission slot at reception to submit assignments online through Turnitin, and of course, you know that would have to just be the tip of the iceberg, transitioning through Theology Online to the development of ARC, the learning management system in 2013, as well as the addition of the Library Hub and the UMS, the unit management system, and then zooming headlong into online teaching in the pandemic. All of this was a sense of moving with the signs of the times as the colleges of the university considered their options for re reaching wider student audiences and fulfilling their mission. In conjunction with the structure, with this, the structure of committees stretched and strained and morphed to deliver on the plethora of criteria required to meet the quality standards of TEXA, the Tertiary Education Quality Standards of Australia, in a moving landscape of university funding and research demands. CTC as the largest college was generous in nomination and representation on these committees and working groups. This was also a strategic involvement as it meant that CTC was in the forefront of shaping and developing our future in the university. For me, one of the most dramatic changes when the academic deans became the academic board. The most positive outcome of this was the addition of deans meetings where the deans actually got to know each other and negotiated issues uh, before they arrived at the board. This ripple was one among many and overall, the overall dynamism of change took on a rapidity that was exhausting as much as it might be exciting, frustrating as much as it could be satisfying. The eternal review cycle can initiate growth, provide systems and processes, but it can also be a treadmill of busyness. In all of this, CTC carefully discerned its space to deliver on its mission and to work with its stakeholders, as well to expand its horizon to delivering specialised theological education in Catholic education, ageing, Christian meditation, and more recently in pastoral leadership. So now, what called us to attention was the pandemic and the need to teach, enrol, graduate online and to learn to operate alone and together in such an unknown changing environment. 
emerging from that time coincided with a timely, far-reaching review of CTC and the Mannix Library. The recommendations of the review called CTC to be proactive in the way forward. One of the significant and enduring recommendations from the report of the review is the one that recommends that should uh, a way forward in the future lead to a move to another university, CTC should endeavour to become an institute in that university so that it doesn't lose its identity that has carved its reputation and constancy through the years. Now, just before I close with the what next, I'm going to take a minor um, excursus at the request for this to say a little bit about what it was like for me as a laywoman to come to work here in CTC. Well, I thought all my dreams had come true. In this beautiful space, I was welcomed and able to bring my experience of management training to bear along with marketing and public relations. Plus, I could fulfil my call to teach the word and to build on my research. My abiding memory of beginning here was the confidence that the then master had in my ability to do the job, even when my own confidence was waning. And the welcome and hospitality of the executive and the administration, the faculty, and particularly the students. I was called sister by some of the students and uh, at the Cafe Solar even, but they gradually worked me out. Thank God, says my family. Um, there were indeed times of robust discussion and tension, but this journey was a time of growth and learning for all of us. It was rather overwhelming, I remember, as my first experience of Senate with only one other woman along that long board table uh, of men heavily weighted with bishops and priests and religious. <sighs> However, that experience changed as I got to know them. In the later years, I was happy to engage Senate, uh, bringing the enrolment statistics and other academic matters to their attention. The Senate has now broadened in mem membership and will again change in light of recommendations from the review. I'm very grateful for the wide ranging experience I have had as both Associate Dean and Academic Dean, as it invited me into the participation at nearly every level of college and university life. I know I've been able to make a contribution and I have grown and developed in so many professional skills. So, what next? CTC is still in transition, as it should be. Understanding where it has come from and engaging critically with its current situation with openness to change and renewal. Already, the landscape of offerings on the timetable allows students to engage online or in the classroom synchronously or asynchronously, and we are developing and being challenged to new ways of doing things and learning new technology. Even more, we are to examine our needs for premises, new modes of communication and community building for students and staff across increasing ways of interacting. All of this we do in light of our faith and the call not only to spread the good news, but to enable others to minister, preach, teach, provide spiritual, pastoral and pastoral care. In doing this, our challenge is to maintain our research output that both underpins and drives our mission. More and more, our expertise is called upon for consultation, discernment, and writing required for processes of synodality, such as the Plenary Council and the Bishop Synod. More and more, the sense of lifelong learning in manageable bites is in tension with the skills needed to prepare for priestly or lay ministry teaching, pastoral care and spiritual guidance. The way we navigate to the next step will require all the powers of the Holy Spirit in our discernment and all our love of each other through Christ, plus all of our wealth of academic, administrative and intellectual wisdom and skill to negotiate meaningful learning paths for the future. 
Often CTC has been referred to as a hidden treasure, and it now needs to stand as a lamp on the lampstand. So thank you so much for Rosemary. Uh, Rosemary was speaking of being invited into participation. That, that, that's been her experience um, on the staff at CTC. It's been the experience of many of us here too. But it's also the experience of our students, I hope, um, invited into participation in the classroom, participation in student life with the SRC and various activities that we're trying to get going again um, now that we're uh, physically in the same place more often. Um, but also the invitation into participation of different kinds of students. Um, lay students, um, students from different walks of life, uh, students online um, that we've been welcoming uh, so intensely in the last couple of years. We're really happy about this innovation for the college. Uh, this, is, this is a great way for us to think for all about being invited into participation. Yeah. Um, our final guest uh, speaker tonight is Dr. Michelle Go, RSM. Uh, Michelle is a Sister of Mercy, uh, and she is a dermatologist uh, working at various clinics and hospitals in Melbourne. Uh, Michelle is a recent graduate of the college, having received an MA in Theology uh, from us in 2016. Thanks very much. So thank you for asking me to speak. So I studied part-time at CTC from 2011 and um, in the Masters of Arts and Theology. And I'm really grateful ha to have had that opportunity. It was a really enriching experience for me. It helped um, me deepen my faith and helped me grow um, from a pretty basic school level kind of catechism um, in my understanding and of faith in God and hopefully towards a more mature adult faith now. So I really appreciated um, learning the rich tradition and history of our faith in church, um, the fundamentals of biblical interpretation and systematic theology. I was introduced to writings of some of the great spiritual writers in history. And in moral theology also gained an appreciation of how scripture and tradition, our faith and our reasoning um, are integrated to direct our attitudes and practical action in our lives of Christian discipleship. I really enjoyed getting to know more and more um, and other people in the CTC community, um, students and teachers alike. And then now, having um, had a background in theological study, it's really helped me in my ministry in healthcare and my presence in parish, helping me form who I am, my interactions and my relationships with others and in my work of service. Also having theological experience has given me the framework and the resources to self-direct my own learning and reading and exploration in a way that I can better discern and find out what is balanced and nuanced and moderate in a way that I feel is relevant to me and current to my faith and spirituality. And it also helps me critically analyze, appraise, judge, and sift out, sift out what could be, say, outdated in language and concepts and less helpful for me in my current situation. So just um, reflecting on in terms of the challenges and opportunities for theological education for us locally in Australia and the world, a theological college has a lot to contribute towards the universal spiritual needs, the spiritual search that people are going through, especially more intensely now given our world events and current struggles. I think we all agree that our world is currently going through a really unstable period in many ways, and people are looking for meaning, purpose, and direction. So how can we contribute to bring gospel joy to the ordinary person in a way that's contextualized to our times, in a way that will touch on the lived experience of people and the spiritual yearnings of people in our day and age? So how can we as a theological institute college engage with the community so that we can participate in discussing issues that today's society is wrestling with, 
not necessarily about getting stuck in political controversies and ideological arguments, but to lend a Christian Catholic viewpoint that is moderate and helpful to people who are grappling with these issues in their everyday lives. And then to also counter what is on mainstream media and internet that can otherwise seem like a predominantly literalist and fundamentalist angle. So it's important to get involved and add a balanced voice to the narrative. And then also with, in our faith-seeking understanding efforts, it's important that we also translate it into outreach activity. So it's a, ch a real challenge to us to get involved, not only in talk, but also in action with the pressing concerns of church and society in our day, like issues of injustice, ecological conversion, Aboriginal reconciliation, poverty, violence, refugee action, and so on. There is also much scope to open up opportunities for people for theological education to be accessible to a broader range of people. So from my interaction with the average, ordinary Christian church-going person, it seems that it's a common misconception that the theology study is reserved for the church elite, so to speak, like priests, religious, church professionals. A lot of people don't even know what the word theology is all about. And then it's a perception that it's something mysterious, so exclusive, esoteric, beyond the grasp of a normal person. So the message really needs to go out more that everyone is invited, everyone is welcome to come and see how theological study can nurture one's faith and deepens one's relationship with God. So I think in terms of accessibility, one limiting factor is time commitment and cost of formal study and the types of courses that are available that may not suit everybody. I definitely don't dispute the importance of rigorous academic scholarship, but some people are not necessarily able to commit or able or have the capacity to commit to that. So we should continue to develop a broad range of what is available right from top high level doctorate research type of courses, but also to the short, less time intensive, less academically strenuous, theology made easy type of seminars, workshops, discussion groups, just to give people a taste for theological education before they commit to more serious commitment. And theological um, study at the tertiary level is really not quite easy. So even though I had a bachelor degree, admittedly in the sciences, I did actually find the English language, the reading, the essay writing, really stressful and demanding. And I can now also appreciate how hard it is for people who have family lives, who work, and also at the same time have to study part time. So I really support the initiative of online webinars, which are increasing in number, they're great because they open up the accessibility to a wider group of people, but at the same time missing out on the face-to-face -face interaction, which is so important in face development and committee and community, um, is a lacking point. And what about developing podcast series? I think that might be something to think about. So by nature, I'm quite pragmatic and realistic, so any ideas for future directions could be dismissed as pie-in-the-sky ideals, but anyway, in, in terms of future directions, if we existed in a world with unlimited financial and human resources, with no concerns about logistics, accreditation, quality control, government grants, some of the ideas on the to-do list would really be um, formation. Formation for people who work on the ground, formation for leadership, for people who work in Catholic organisations, schools, universities, parishes, diocesan offices, the PJP, public juridical person bodies, people who work in healthcare and social justice ministries, chaplaincy, people who work in care for the aged and also disability. But I'm also mindful that there's, there's so much mandatory and professional training that people already have to do in their jobs, but I think we would all agree that formation in ministry from a faith perspective adds just the extra dimension, that salt or leaven, that essential grounding that underpins everything we do in our care for others in our pastoral ministry, in treating others respectfully and kindly, as is our gospel imperative. So I think, and also formation for leading um, people to lead liturgy, to lead groups in small groups, in communities or parish level, to be centers of spirituality, to be schools of prayer. And then finally, as surely as one institute, we can't do it all, so we have to work in partnership between colleges and institutions, and also ecumenically as well with our Christian, um, other Christian church friends. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you for those great ideas and formation initiatives about bringing gospel joy and a balanced voice to our world. Thanks very much. 
This brings us to the end of our five um, addresses by our panellists. Uh, I'm going to ask you now uh, if you have any comments that you'd like to make at this stage um, from the panel, um, having heard these, these um, uh, talks. Um, I've got a microphone here that we could use. Um, so I'll ask you if you'd like to speak, and after that point, we'll throw it open to the floor for questions. Thank you. It just occurred to me in listening to Michelle where I really do see the need for theological literacy and how do we advance that so that it's not just the preserve of the clergy or the academics but indeed starts to feed our communities because sometimes some of the things you read at times show you know people are passionate about their faith but they don't have a proper understanding of what that faith might be. And, and that's where I think a theological literacy and in the forms that would make it accessible um, to me is very appealing. And I'd certainly like to see that happen because we won't be able to take this synodal path if it's not the work of the whole community. I want to say two contradicting things. Um, on the one hand, no doubt because of the rather privileged experience that I have had over many years, I would um, like to see the What Next have a much stronger focus on research. That the University of Divinity and the Catholic Theological College becomes a significant player in serious published research. Now for many years we and for many good reasons, we haven't been able to do that. Uh, some, some people have done it, others haven't. Some have had opportunity, others haven't. Um, but I do think that's going to be the hallmark of a quality uh, University of Divinity and of a quality college within the University of Divinity, and that is published research. But on the other hand, in contradiction, in an agreement with Terry and Michelle, to me, the greatest, the greatest single problem we face as a Catholic community is not just a lack of a theological background, but a biblical background. The Word of God preached as the Word of God Sunday after Sunday, where you get a systematic reading of a gospel should enable us to have a catechesis year by year by year, and it just doesn't happen. And as we go back to Leo's Providentissimus Deus, Dei Verbum, Verbum the, um, the, the uh, document on Revelation of the Council, since then various other documents, a whole synod on the Word of God in the life of the Church, but there is nothing formal to actually educate everyone in um, how the world works and, and uh, what it should be saying to us. But, uh, so the contradiction in terms of more research and uh, more communication of the basic biblical story to our people. Thank you. about um, exciting possibilities for formation and in particularly to do with Pope Francis's idea of shifting the church into a missionary model. Um, just one thing I was thinking, Josh, is that if we turn our thought around to that very point of mission and teach from mission, because sometimes we can teach from uh, a curriculum or a direction 
that doesn't actually always invite uh, the sense of mission. So uh, f for me, the sense of, uh, I love teaching Luke and narrative, and you know, uh, <laughs> that uh, so it starts with discovering that the Holy Spirit is an active person in this, and then I bore them to death all the way through about the Holy Spirit calling them to mission. So, so in a way, it depends on your perspective as, as you teach and, and move uh, to engage people in their own lives and what's happening and where they're going. So what do you see as the role of a, of a Catholic institution to go into the public arena and start to address what we have to put up with every day? Thank you. Um, so the, the, the question is in the context of the controversy about Essendon CEO and the Israel Folau case and such like, and so a request for um, uh, knowledgeable and influential Catholics and Catholic institutions to speak into the public um, sphere in such situations to tell people about the Catholic faith. Would somebody like to discuss this issue? Well, I think you hit, you hit the nail right on the head of a really serious issue, and that is how do we cross the line from the people on this seat here and the people there? And I think you can manifest that, that, that across all sorts of areas of public discourse in Australia. There is very little conduct, that's very true. My own experience, however, um, is it's very difficult to get into that discussion. Um, I quoted that passage from 1 Corinthians and then the other passage from Acts. Um, we are on trial because we begin, believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus as a saving event. And that is an odd message that the Australian culture at large um, finds a bit of a waste of time. And um, so I agree with you entirely that we need to, to develop new strategies I do not think it's the responsibility of CTC. Um, maybe it might be a wider vision for the university itself to start looking at the way of entering more aggressively into public discourse. I, I think what you're saying is so true. There are so many allegations and accusations thrown about the stupidity of Christianity and what they say we believe in is just not what we believe in. I mean, they've got it all wrong. But the other reality I always find very interesting as I get older is there is a remarkable phenomenon in Australian society and maybe in other societies. And that is what I call secular Christianity. There are a lot of wonderful people out there who don't go to mass and who don't know anything about the gospels or anything else. And they are terrific people. Really high quality mothers and fathers educating their kids beautifully, showing extraordinary love for the community as such, for refugees and all the rest of it, without the church. And I think that huge composition of Australian population, which I would like to call secular Christianity, is a phenomenon that we need to pay more attention to and give credit to. So there's a lot of things rolled into what you're asking, the question you're asking, the challenge is there for us to show a public face. <coughs> How we do it, I think the strategy is uh, a question. And the other thing is, in my own few efforts that I've ever made, they won't listen to you. The media won't give you a voice. And uh, so it's a pretty difficult situation in which we find ourselves. Okay. I just tell you, just taking that up. I think the basic thing, it seems to me, that we can reach everybody is simply by being human. And what does that mean? It means being spirit-filled. That is, having love, joy, peace, patience, and all the rest of it. So Irenaeus says, when you see someone like that, you may not realise it, but when you see someone like that, you actually have a vision of God. So our common humanity is our, surely our first point of contact with any and all of them. Bishop Martin Ash shared with me um, some notes that from a talk given to the new bishops, and I don't know whether Bishop Shamers heard this one also, though, in different sessions. 
given by Monsignor Thomas Halleck, the Czech thinker. And he makes the point at one stage where he says, look, you know, today in these, uh, the census that comes out so often, the increasing number of people who say, no, I belong to the nuns, I have no religious identity or affiliation that I would sort of claim to belong to. And, and that group is growing and growing. And Halleck makes the point here that atheists are not the dominant segment of this group. Among the nuns, we have find agnostics, uh, uh, spiritual seekers, people who describe themselves as spiritual but not religious, yeah. Christians disillusioned by churches, um, esoterics, uh, neo-gnosticism and sympathizers of alternative religious streams. Mm -hmm. And he makes this point, the future of the church depends largely on its ability to communicate with this group of, group of nuns, N-O-N-E-S, uh, especially with the spiritual seekers. The formation of candidates for priestly and other pastoral ministry in the church still focuses primarily on care for parishioners, in inverted commas, traditional believers, or on the mission to expand the number of believers. Communicating with the NONES, however, requires an entirely different approach. The avant-garde in this field, as he sees it, is a so-called categorical, categorical um, pastoral the Ministry of Chaplains in hospitals, the army or prisons, they are for all in these institutions. Their ministry is spiritual accompaniment. It is based on the conviction that everyone's life has a spiritual dimension, the search for meaning. And I think that's what Father Austin is pointing to as well. But it is that challenge there for us. Yeah, yeah I totally agree um, about the secular Christianity. Um, people are searching, people come up to me and they don't ask about Catholicism but they ask the questions of meaning and purpose and they are searching people I think um, it goes all back to faith literacy within the people who are already Catholic offering the opportunity to deepen their own faith and understanding so that they can actually in their being be changed be um, a person of faith who does not need to preach from the pulpit because people are not listening or right, but also just in their presence, um, preach the gospel. And then having a background of theological knowledge or literacy can help people speak in a way that would be relevant and be listened to in the world that is not necessarily interested in religion per se. Just add, would you, Max? Um, some of the strengths that we have are, 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 are similar to you know, some that we have here, people who have been engaged in their doctorates and their ongoing research. So uh, I, I'm very lucky at the moment to have some time to research, which I've been trying to break out to um, in previous years. So um, it's probably easier to say what we should add because at the moment we are probably doing things within our academic fields like um, in philosophy and biblical studies and whatever. And I, um, but in you know, seeing some of the new uh, uh, ideas for collaborative grants and things and how broad they are in much more practical theology that brings the skills and theology but to, um, to interact with issues in the, in our world, the climate change, uh, migration, uh, any any number of issues that are facing all of us, I think our strength is that is to to move to further interact. I think we 
I think we've got numbers of people who can do that, uh, but they need time, and we can do it in each of the disciplines, but we need, need time. I can see faculty sitting around here who, who'd love to have some time to write and, and engage that research. Someone else might want to add? Max? I would just comment on Rosemary's note on the need for time. I mean, in my as I said, I've been a particularly blessed, uh, had enormous opportunities and financial support from my own congregation to produce a considerable uh, amount of research over the years. But in my years at CTC, I've also had occasion to, to work with various of you, some of you here, uh, in your attempts to, um, to go beyond the doctorate and do further research. And I'm well aware of just how difficult it is. And I think it's a, it's, um, it's a mindset. Uh, at the level of the individual. I think it is also a structural issue where so much uh, teaching and administration is uh, heaped upon people that they can't find the, the time. Um, but, um, so I'm well aware of that and how difficult it is for people to do this. I mean, people who've done very fine doctorates and they haven't, they haven't been published and um, because they haven't had the time the year or two after the doctorate to do it. That's where we've got to rethink, I think, and restructure in the future so that in the future, if we're looking future, I think if you're going to go anywhere, we've got to base the future on some, not enormous amounts, but, but some quality published research. And the people in the, at CTC have all got the capacity to do it. But we've got to develop a structure and a mindset that generates that published research. And that is a very big step. I am well aware of that. That was a very interesting list of types, Bishop Terry, from uh, your list there, from Tol Thomas Harlick, about the various audience. I think there were a few esoteric nuns taught me when I was a child, I think, if it, among that list that you've got there. That was an exceedingly rich uh, conversation uh, from Austin's meeting at the Franciscan Priory in 1966 through to Michelle's challenges for theological literacy and formation in uh, just-in-time, accessible, open and friendly ways. A very rich and very challenging conversation, which we'll try to capture. We've been lucky to have our friends here recording this, and the recording will be available through our website. We might also seek to gather the notes that have been spoken from tonight and make them available in some format th uh, as well. Uh, so I thank each of our speakers for a thoughtful, well, targeted, well discerned and, and, and very challenging uh, re recollections and, and thoughts, visions for the, for the future. Uh, can I thank to the college uh, staff, thank you to Catherine for facilitating tonight, thank you to Sarah, our events coordinator, Sarah Styring, thank you to V for her assistance and, uh, and, and many of the staff who've contributed to today. Thank you for the team uh, here too at the Catholic Leadership uh, Centre. Please join us for other events marking our 50th on Sunday the 5th of March. There will be an ecumenical Vesper service at the cathedral uh, where we hope to celebrate and join with other friends from the University of Divinity, uh, the, the, the long association over the 50 years with the MCD University of Divinity. And then our annual mass and uh, prize giving in, in June of next year will be uh, the college's, if you like, internal opportunity to celebrate. So please join us for other things. We also congratulate the, the, the Corpus Christi College and the Mannix Library who are celebrating their centenary in, 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 in 2023 next year. And we look forward to joining with you in various ways to celebrate that as, as well. And as well, another, uh, the next, uh, another event coming up at CTC, uh, we're, we're uh, very delighted to host the Walter Sylvester Memorial Annual Lecture this year, a lecture uh, sponsored by the Palatine family uh, and the University of Divinity. And this year the speaker is the Bishop of Parramatta, Bishop Vincent Long, speaking on the topic inverting the ecclesial pyramid 60 years after Vatican II, the evolution of a synodal church in Australia under Pope Francis. That's on Tuesday the 25th of October at 6.30 p.m., an earlier start, 6.30. 
at CTC in the Knox uh, Lecture Theatre at CTC or via Zoom. There are details on our, uh, our website uh, and other information, so please join us uh, then. Um, I think we're there. So any other, nothing else to do? So please, there's, um, there's some drinks, there's some uh, food to eat, and hopefully your cars are still in your car parks uh, where you left them uh, when, when we go out. But otherwise, thank you very much for your attendance. Thanks to the seminaries who've gone to efforts to be here tonight as well. And thanks uh, to all of you, staff, friends of the college, uh, alumni, thanks for joining us uh, tonight. Would you please thank our panel members one more time? <laughs>